Well, thank you for coming today. I'm, I'm really glad to see the size of the crowd here. Um, it seems really fitting that April of 2017 is the final month in Seattle Audubon's 100th anniversary centennial celebration. So it seems very appropriate that we are here today to talk about neighborhood flyways, which is our new urban conservation campaign, which is how we are intending to launch our second 100 years. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the kickoff of the Neighborhood Flyways campaign. I know that your time is valuable, and this is a weekday afternoon, so I very much appreciate you spending this time with us. Our recent strategic plan has outlined a set of comprehensive tools to restore a resilient and productive tree canopy across the city of Seattle. And there are several components to that work that I will speak to specifically uh, in just a few moments. But uh, first I'd like to take care of a little context and a little business for today. So at Seattle Audubon, we like to talk about how birds can be ambassadors, that they can capture people's imagination, they can turn a vacant urban lot into a habitat, and they can bring people together. And I think that last point is especially evident here today. Um, as I've gotten out and spoken with folks over the past year, I just started with Seattle Audubon just a year ago, uh, I've seen the good faith that the Audubon name invites. And so I'm grateful for the participation of many people here, some new faces and some faces who've been with us for some time. So our goals today are, there's a few of them, are to highlight the range of people and organizations who are working here in Seattle to preserve and restore the urban tree canopy all of which together presents huge benefits for local habitats, local wildlife, and migratory and resident birds. Today, we seek to build an awareness about all that's going on in the world of urban tree canopy restoration, to build enthusiasm for the work to come, and to honor all of those who work in this realm. We all come to this work with a very different motivation and a different point of view, but we're all working in the same direction. Our collective efforts all add up to restored natural systems in an urban landscape that build in habitat resilience, which is exactly what birds need in a warming climate. For Seattle Audubon, today means helping us understand, are we on the right track with this? Are there others who we need to be talking with? And how will we ensure that we have the most comprehensive and accurate information? The series of presentations this afternoon will reveal the common challenges and opportunities in our work, and each speaker will share with you their hopes for collaborations going forward. So on the goal of building enthusiasm, uh, we are going to be handing out some sheets, and if you haven't already picked them up downstairs, Seattle Audubon staff will be providing those at the end of the presentations, but at a minimum today, we wanna make sure that we are capturing the information about the folks who are here today, and we also have some questions we would love for you to answer to tell us what you liked what you heard today, what you thought was missing, and how you'd like to stay involved. So that's to come, but as we get there, um, we're gonna start our, our presentations, the subject matter presentations, we'll have six of those, beginning at about 2.15. We'll wrap up around a quarter after four and we'll have about 45 minute, minutes worth of networking and social time downstairs. There are food and drink available for purchase. Seattle Audubon has also provided some food. We know we're here for a few hours, so we wanna make sure that we can get through it. Um, and we will reconvene up here at about five o'clock and there will be a moderated question and answer session with the panel. I do wanna point out that we are being filmed today. So if you are not interested in coming up to the front to ask a question, uh, just know that Seattle Audubon staff will be on hand with providing information so you can write down a question and get it up to us at the front and we will make sure that gets read. And for the last hour, we're going to peel off and do some small group discussions around the topics that you heard about from each speaker today. There will also be a whiteboard downstairs during the break that I'll be at. If there was a topic you were hoping you heard about today that you didn't, please come and talk to me because we wanna make sure that we're capturing that and we'll try to bring some small group discussion around all of these topics uh, between six and seven. 
So, in policy work, too often organizations, conservation organizations are no different, are put in a position of having to react to things. So I asked that folks today came to, to this conversation with more questions than answers, with a sense of open-mindedness and inquiry, and to think broadly about the interconnections in urban conservation work. Our second century of conservation will look very different than the first, because the reality is an urban conservation model is just very different than the preservation model of our past 100 years. We have a broad base of support in this work going forward. Today will afford many insights into how local conservation objectives are being achieved, but it's also intended to display the virtues of a coalition-based approach that Seattle Audubon has identified as the most able to succeed in urban conservation work. With so many people working on these issues from so many different perspectives, a little investigation quickly revealed that we all share the common goal of ensuring that the Emerald City lives up to its nickname. Seattle has lost about half of the 40% tree canopy cover that residents enjoyed in the 1970s. So as I got out and I talked with partners, I realized that a lot of us were trying to turn this around. And so the group who's been formally engaged and who are represented by the speakers here today as the Neighborhood Flyways group is the City of Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment, Seattle Parks Foundation, Seattle Public Utilities, the Nature Conservancy, and Urban Forest Carbon Registry. So we'll be hearing from them and their work. Seattle Audubon last year also headed up a coalition of partners working with the city and the US Fish and Wildlife Service to see that Seattle was officially designated uh, an urban bird treaty city. And I'll be talking about those programming elements and how that's represented in our work going forward. We're also trying to connect in closer ways with our partners at neighboring Audubon chapters, and that little graphic off to the right gives you a sense that we have a lot of bird-loving friends in our work all around us here in Seattle. And there are ways that we've already articulated that we can work more closely with our neighbors in order to achieve bigger conservation impacts. I also wanted to point out that for those interested in the Urban Bird Treaty City work, we will be hosting a kickoff event and signing ceremony with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the city at Lincoln Park on May 5th. So I do want to be very clear that the group presenting today is by no means the full range of organizations who are working on these issues in the city of Seattle. Far from it. So I have a long list of acknowledgments that I'd like to get to, and as I mentioned, we're really trying to develop a, a sense of enthusiasm as well as respect and honor for all these groups out there who are working for the city's urban tree canopy. Those groups include Forterra and the Green Seattle Partnership, Tree Pack and Plant Amnesty, the Center for Urban Horticulture and the UW Botanical Gardens, uh, Jessica Farmer is here tabling downstairs today, and I would encourage folks to check out the Urban Forest Symposium over there on the 23rd of May. Lance Young and the Inner Urban Trail Tree Preservation Society, the City's Urban Forestry Commission, the leadership at Seattle Parks and Recreation, members of the Seattle City Council, Stewardship Partners, and the Nature Consortium, just to name a few. And after today, we will keep reaching out, we will keep talking, and we will keep sharing our vision. And we will work to engage more people in this effort. I also want to give a special thanks to Linda Mapes from the Seattle Times, who was very instrumental in encouraging us to pursue this concept today, and for her coverage of the challenges and opportunities in protecting Seattle's tree canopy. I have a very special acknowledgement today for Cass Turnbull, who was one of the first people who I spoke with about this event. Cass was instrumental in encouraging me with her, as you probably know, her great enthusiasm for the urban forest to come to this from a place of bringing people together to talk about the common ground that we all share. As we know, Cass passed away early this year. She was slated to participate as a speaker today. And I think that we owe it to Cass to bring the same level of commitment and passion to protecting the urban forest that she would have represented here today. Applause 
I also want to thank our speakers, who we will be hearing from today. Uh, we couldn't be doing this without you all. Uh, I want to thank the board at Seattle Audubon, and especially the staff, who really, uh, it's full court press with Seattle Audubon staff today, who really went all out to make sure that all the logistics were covered. I'd like to thank the Horizons Foundation, who was the first institutional organization to invest in the Neighborhood Flyways campaign. They are covering the costs, which allow us to make this free to the public today. Uh, and finally, I want to thank the staff at Town Hall for all of your help in making this a successful event today. So, many thanks to all of you. So, defining the urban forest. Very quickly, you know, we're going to hear a lot about that, so I won't spend too much time, but it's not just about green belts, backyards, or parks, although those play critical anchors in functioning landscapes in the city. There's so much more to it. And just as an exercise, you know, when you, when you look at this map, your eyes are drawn to certain patches of bird habitat. You know, you've got the Schmitz Park Preserve up here, Camp Long, Longfellow Creek, the Duwamish Greenbelt, the Chasty Greenbelt over here. It's clear that there are big, significant patches of habitat in Seattle. But when you start to zoom in, you start to see more features popping out. Adjacent to the Greenbelts, are the smaller but viable patches of urban forest here, what we think of as the collective backyard, as we continue to kind of drill down. And here you start to see how individual backyards together can make up patches of habitat, and those collective backyards that are distinct from, but can be connected to, green belts and parks. The bottom line is that the urban forest is everywhere, and it is all of these taken together. At Seattle Audubon and among our partners, we know that we need to pay attention to each type, and we need to have a strategy for conserving, restoring, and enhancing the habitat values in each place. In the individual backyard, Seattle, has a relative, Seattle does have a very uh, relatively high percentage of land zoned in single family, which presents a lot of opportunities not available in denser cities. So even on the individual level, there's a lot going on in a backyard and the ability to customize strategies even among different layers of the backyard itself to produce different results or, in this case, strategies that you can pursue to lure your favorite birds to your own backyards. So, more than 50% of the world's population now lives in cities, and Seattle Audubon's new turn toward urban work is not that unique. It reflects the work of many of our partners who are out ahead of us on this. Groups like Forterra, The Nature Conservancy, and others are prioritizing urban conservation and preservation models and that engagement that goes with it and how we work with communities is a, very different than how it was done last century. A different model demands a different approach, broader coalitions, unexpected partnerships, and new tools, essentially what we're here to talk about today. So, oops. Actually, on this, it's uh, important to point out that this slide here, though it's kind of a, a crude sketch, it's intended to represent the amount of impervious surface in the city of Seattle. So it's approximately third, it's about, about a third of the land area in the city, about 31% was what I heard at the uh, re regional open space strategy meeting just last week. Um, but think about that because that's just a couple of ticks less than the city of Los Angeles. So when you're working with all that concrete, your restoration options are somewhat limited. And restoration is always contextual. So when this is your canvas, it's really about what you do with the other two-thirds of the land in the city that matters most. So that said, the challenges and the opportunities before us are not only shaped by on-the-ground restoration opportunities, but it's about the communities that we will engage in how we do it. Conservation, community organizing, and social justice are essential considerations in conservation work in the 21st century. I don't know here if folks saw a recent article by Brenton Mock in Outdoor Magazine, but it was titled, The Green Movement is Talking About Racism? It's About Time. He said, given the history of conservationists elevating endangered plant life over endangered people of color, 
It is environmentalism's soul that needs saving. He has a valid point. There are too many examples in the history of conservation of preservationists who discriminated personally and in statute against African Americans, Native Americans, immigrants, and other communities that didn't really have the power to fight back. The bottom line was that their work was about remote preservation and oftentimes keeping people out. Our work going forward will be about engagement here at home in the city. Environmentalism begins in the city, and I think we all know that dense, efficient living is ultimately the, the lightest way to live on this planet. But density cannot come at the expense of investments in green space and maintaining nature close to where people live. So another job that we have today is, issue, is to issue a call to the conservation community to invest in green spaces in the city, focus on these places where so many people live, to, to achieve a balance of density, green infrastructure, and keep them healthy, clean, and livable, and also a place that can sustain habitat for wildlife and birds. Our efforts should also develop new funding opportunities to support these systems, and those things will not come about on their own, but only with our collective commitment. So we are currently building a sign-on list to represent the size and the power of this movement that we will share with elected officials around the city. So when you have a moment downstairs, please do stop by the Seattle Audubon table and talk with Seth Steyer, our new conservation manager, he just came on board a couple of weeks ago, who's drafted a letter intended to be shared with city officials, and we're trying to add as many names to that as possible. With your engagement and your ideas and your guidance, we today launch the Neighborhood Flyways campaign. And I'd like to tell you more about the details of that work as it's been articulated in our new strategic plan. The equation is pretty simple. We know that we need solid baseline data. We need new policy programs and advocacy tools. We intend to apply new outreach to engage audiences, both private and public landowners, and build stewardship around environmental conservation. And then from there, move forward with an ambitious plan to directly engage people through direct outreach to grow and restore the habitat that exists in the city and to connect those habitats, with the goal being unbroken migratory pathways of habitats across Seattle, a major urban area for both resident and migratory birds. So this is all new, and while our new strategic plan has identified these in concepts, some of these do remain concepts, and that is part of what we're here to do today, is to discuss in the Q&A session and then further in small group discussions afterwards, because for in order for this all to achieve its fullest potential, we need to be reviewing ourselves, informing ourselves, and this effort should be shaped by an engaged constituency. That effort is going to move to the next level today. So, baseline data. We know that any credible structure needs a strong foundation. Seattle Audubon has maintained the Seattle tree map for some time, though in recent years, the maintenance of that database has fallen behind. It's something that we know we need to bring back online. We're bringing this tool back and we're also connecting it to our partners work. There are a lot of efforts around citizen science and tree mapping that are already happening and we're trying to figure out the right way to bring it all together so we have an accurate picture of the urban tree canopy as a baseline for going forward. What's really interesting is that the Neighborhood Bird Project, which is a citizen science driven program that Seattle Audubon has maintained since 1994, it's effectively a, uh, a bird census that we have been collecting now over the past almost three decades in nine parks in and around Seattle. This will provide the foundation for neighborhood flyways married together with the Seattle tree map to show where high quality habitat exists, where birds spend their time, and how they move around. So these are not all necessarily new programs and policies themselves, but we intend to apply them in new ways here in Seattle. And those are, as I mentioned, last year Seattle Audubon was part of a coalition that worked with the city of Seattle to ensure its designation as an urban bird treaty city. 
a designation of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that comes with what I like to think of our uh, policy guidance and packages of programming around bird-friendly building ordinances, so that would be bird-safe glass, and we've already seen some interest in the city of sharing our ideas for how that could be in, brought into the building code. Bird, uh, I'm sorry, lights out programs. We know that building lights are, uh, have a traumatic impact on bird mortality in urban environments. Our neighbors over at Eastside Audubon in Bellevue are currently developing their programming, and so we'll be coordinating with them on that. There are cats indoors programs that come with urban bird treaty city work. The folks down in Portland Audubon, they actually have something called a catio tour that takes you and shows you how you can install patios for cats to keep them indoors while still providing them the opportunity to go outside. But moreover, the designation as the urban bird treaty city does also open up new funding opportunities that we'll be pursuing as well. The beauty of the Audubon network is that there are about 450 chapters around the country, but we also have the National Audubon Society, which provides a lot of strategic planning, programming, and guidance that we can apply in a way that makes sense where we live. So the National Audubon Society's programming called Bird Friendly Communities, it, it's, it's basically guidance that will, will complement the development of our new urban policy work by addressing local threats to birds and connecting the outcomes of that conservation work with readers uh, here locally, but in a bigger context. So this is one of the programs that we're gonna be carrying forward to, but basically what it adds up to is we'll be working with city partners to ensure that urban development is the most compatible with bird populations that it can be. In terms of outreach and stewardship, we need to move those programs and policies into action, so we've outlined concrete means of directly engaging with organizations and agencies and individual landowners, strategies that I mentioned for the various types of urban forest lands in the city, and one of them is our own program. Seattle Audubon began the Gardening for Life program about 15 years ago to share the word what folks can do with choices in their own backyards and how that can have a beneficial impact on birds along the Pacific Flyway. So we already have these tools in-house, but we understand that several of our partners also have different types of backyard certification programs. So we'll be working to either bring those programs to people serving as the local outreach lead or applying our own program. The bottom line is, we have different options so we can work with people in a way to customize different offerings in a way that they feel some ownership and some stewardship of this. So another offering of the National Audubon Society, which is new last year's, is the Plants for Birds database. And what this does is it allows users to customize their landscaping with native plants in a way that invites their favorite bird species. It's a very cool tool. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest checking it out. It's very easy, user-friendly engagement, but what it does is you can determine what types of plants you can make uh, or you can landscape with at home that will invite the birds that you want to see. And the benefit of all this is it focuses solely on native plants that attract species, which is good for our watersheds. So taking together all these components, the data, the programs, the policies, and the outreach tools, here's the ultimate goal is once we have a sense of where the good habitat patches are in the city, and this is simply an example representation, the Flyways Restoration Initiative intends to get us to a place where we know where those habitat patches are and where the gaps are. And we intend to bring resources, including direct outreach to public and private landowners in those areas, to bring all of these tools so that we are building and strengthening these habitat migratory and resident bird pathways across the city. And again, we are a long way from the 40% canopy cover that Seattle enjoyed in the 1970s, so we know that both resident and migratory birds need these corridors, and this new effort will directly target this and reach out to a number of different partners. So, all this said, Seattle Audubon, we feel ready, and knowing that going forward we're not going to be able to do it alone, we know that we will need partners in this work. 
So we intend to provide a helping hand and we intend to serve as a helping hand. And with 100 years of environmental conservation accomplishments in our history, we are ready to grow our partnership-based efforts that can move all of this work forward toward our goal of a benefited urban forest and birds that are supported here locally. We have a solid plan at our back, we have a credible brand, we have an amazing staff, and we have the desire to share the work and whatever credit may come with it. So among a possible coalition, however, we are but one player and today seeks to shine a light on all the others engaged in this work. So thank you for coming, and now I'd like to get on with the program. Thank you.